welcome to New Hope Church, everyone. It's good to see you. I like it. 2022. <laughs> Yay. Um, resolutions. I know we all have them. Uh, I made a few and I was talking to my friend and it had a lot to do with fitness and eating healthy. And I think those things are great. Uh, but I just thought to myself, you know, what if we... Uh, put a little bit more work into what is inside of us than on the outside and what would the church and what would the world look like if we cared a little bit more about those kinds of things. And so with that, I just want to use that to encourage you today. If, you, um, if you're at, in New Hope and you haven't joined a live group ever yet, maybe it's time to check it out. Try it out. Just double in it and uh, see how it goes because I'm telling you, you're going to meet a great group of people and they're going to hold each other accountable and pray for one another and support one another. It really, really is amazing. Or maybe uh, you haven't served at New Hope yet. Um, we have so many amazing ministries, and I want to encourage you to, to see um, all of the ministries we have that you can serve at. And I promise you, you can talk to all of the people at New Hope, how incredible serving here is and how life-giving it really can be. Or maybe... Uh, you just need to make a commitment with your family to just come to church more, to just um, dedicate yourselves to being here on a Sunday and spending time with the Lord um, and congregating with other Christians. So uh, I want to encourage you in that today. If you haven't done those things, maybe uh, put that on your list. It's great to work out and eat well and do all of those things, but uh, it's going to mean way more to you. Uh, when we start looking at the inside and, and, and looking at our relationship with Christ and growing in that and diving deeper into His Word. Amen. So I'm going to invite you to stand with us right now. We're going to start doing that. We're going to praise our King right now. Amen. It's good. Let's get our hands up. Well, I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever 
into this new year singing it as well with my soul. Jesus, you are still on the throne.
Just worship our King.
Yes, Jesus, thank you that we get to worship you, the Savior of the world, our Creator, the only living God. And we declare that today. And we refuse to live in fear over COVID, over any other worry that we might have, whether it be in our relationships or financial. We declare that we serve the King of Kings and we will stand in faith on your name, Father. We thank you for this church and that we just get to worship you in this place. I wanna pray for Pastor Tom coming up to, to um, minister your word unto us. Holy Spirit, just be with us right now and help us to just be laser focused on you right now to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It is good to worship with you and welcome to our second talk from the Book of Revelation series. So, will Christians be raptured from the Great Tribulation? I doubt it. But what do I know? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Now I will tell you what I know. Today we're going to talk about two of the big book of Revelation pieces. What is the rapture and what about the great tribulation? But let me just quickly walk you through the book of Revelation. Don't think of it as a linear chart. It's a revelation of significant events. It doesn't fit well in a linear chart and you'll get frustrated if you try and see it that way. Revelation 1 is about a vision of Jesus. Chapter 2 and 3 are letters to seven churches. And then 6 to 16, now that's a big chunk, are about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of God's judgment and wrath. Even in the midst of all of that, you see the heart of God in chapter 9, verse 20, where God is grieving the fact that in spite of all of these plagues, people still refuse to worship God. They would not renounce their demon worship or their idols made of gold or silver, brass, stone, or wood, Neither would, uh, which, none of which can hear or talk or walk. Neither would they change their minds or attitudes about their murders, their witchcraft, their immorality, and their theft. Now, Revelation 10 to 14 has some pretty amazing events. In chapter 10, John gets a scroll to eat at, sort of an infusion of the next bit of prophecy. You know, when God inspired people to write the Bible, it wasn't like the Matrix download, you know? I know jujitsu. You know? <laughs> or, the, or the pseudo-psychology of a, a automatic writing where you sort of go into a trance and you just write the Bible. No, 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 God used humans to write his miracle divine book and at times they had to take a bathroom break and go get a drink of water and come back to writing some more. It really is a miracle book. God does his miracles through human beings like us. In, in chapter 11, there's two witnesses that are martyred and then they come back to life and a quarter of Jerusalem is destroyed. Chapter 12 goes back to Christmas. So see, it doesn't fit that linear thing. In chapter 13, we have the mark of the beast and we'll talk about that next week. Chapter 14, 144,000 are saved, and that's not the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's 12 times 12,000. That's everybody who's supposed to come to the Lord does come to the Lord. 15 and 16 finish the seven bowls of God's wrath. 17 and 18 are the punishment of Babylon, a.k.a. Rome, and maybe Russia, China, or America, or Canada, we'll touch on that next week as well. And then 19 to 22 is heaven. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb. We get to reign on earth with the Lord for a thousand years. And then finally, once and for all, Satan and all of those are, who are his are destroyed. And 21 and 22 are pictures of heaven. Verse 15 says, Anyone whose name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Hey, is that you? Is your name not in there? If it is, my friend, give your life 
to Jesus today. Well, that's just a quick summary of the book, but let's get into the Great Tribulation. The first time we hear about it is hundreds of years before Jesus in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10 verse 1 talks about many tribulations. Daniel had another vision, and it, 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 it concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of great tribulation, wars, sorrows. And at this time, Daniel understood what it meant for his time. We read about the Great Tribulation again in Revelation 7.14. It says, these are the ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. And in Revelation 3.10, God promises, he says, because you have patiently obeyed me, despite persecution, therefore I will protect you from the time of Great Tribulation and temptation, which will come upon the world to test everyone. So God will protect you in the tribulation that comes to affect, to test everyone. Now Sarah said last week that we should do away with dispensationalism. And I would definitely say we need to do away with hyper-dispensationalism. I'll give you an idea what that is. I had a professor in Bible college in Florida who told us that the Sermon on the Mount didn't apply to any of us. We didn't have to try and live it because it applied for the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. My friends, that is one, crazy, and two, that is dispensationalism gone way too far. You should dispense with that. Dispensationalists will conclude that God will rapture, God will rescue God will airlift the church out of the earth before the great tribulation. That means that all the judgments of the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bulls will not affect us. So basically everything from Revelation chapter 4 on has little to do with any Christians already alive today because chapter 4 mentions a trumpet blast, airlifting John up into heaven, enabling him to see future events. And some think that that triggers, that trumpet triggers 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, what is called by many the rapture. It says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud command, and the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Is that not glorious? I can't wait for that. So some say that will happen And then we won't have to go through the Great Tribulation. That would be the dispensational view. Are they right? Maybe. I won't fight you on it. And I hope you won't fight me on it. But I wouldn't count on it. You see, dispensationalism is a pretty new way of understanding apocalyptic literature. It's only about 200 years old. It's an American approach. It gives us the left behind books and movies. It gives us charts and graphs and codes to interpret current events and answer the question, is Russia Magog or was Napoleon Magog as the Hasidic Jews believed? And I know that's a question burning on the hearts of your children and your faith fives. (laughs) But it gives us charts kind of like this. And I'll tell you, this is like the simplest version of any chart you'll ever see. They get far more complicated than this. Now, don't get me wrong. I love all that left behind stuff. My life was radically, radically transformed from a shy, quiet, frightened, timid boy instantaneously one night to a bold street preacher evangelist at one showing of the movie The Thief in the Night. 
a movie that scared the daylights out of us. And it was based on 2 Peter 3, 10. It says this, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and its works will be laid bare. Put that together with Jesus' apocalyptic preaching in Matthew 24, 40. Two men will be working in a field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be going about their household tasks. One will be taken and one will be left. So be prepared, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. My friends, these warnings should scare you. And I can promise you that within the next 100 years, Jesus will come back for you. Last week, Dave was holding and praying for his wife, Vicki, in the hospital. When he had pr finished praying for her, he said, Amen. On that, Vicki exhaled her last breath on earth. Jesus came and got her and brought her home as he said he would in John 14. And instantaneously, Vicki breathed her first breath in eternity. One was taken and the other was left. If you're not in a relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you should be afraid. So what's the answer? Will Christians be raptured before the great tribulation? Before the seven years of tribulation? At the middle point at three and a half years before it gets too bad? How does it work? Friends, we should read these more like great tribulations. You see, on a careful reading, in the seven seals, one quarter of the earth is destroyed. Revelation 6, 8 says, I looked, and there before me was the pale horse. Its rider named Death and Hades was followed close behind him. And they were given power over one quarter of the earth to kill by sword and famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now, later, the seven trumpets are sounded and one third of mankind is killed. It says in verse 18 of chapter 9, a third of mankind was killed by the plagues of fire, smoke and sulfur that came out of their mouth. And then finally, the seven bulls, it's all over, man. Chapter 15 says, I saw heaven and another great marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues last, because with them, God's wrath is complete. Rather than looking at Revelation as a linear graph line, it's more helpful, I think, to see it as a progression of events, more in a spiral pattern of coming around to ever greater tribulations affecting more and more of the earth. I find that much more helpful. Because when you ask the question, will the church be raptured before the great tribulation? Well, the answer is, well, let's just talk about the rapture for a second. <laughs> is Jesus coming back once or twice? Is he coming back once to rescue the church and then another time to judge the world? I believe Jesus is coming back one more time, the second and last coming of Christ. When he comes, there will be this trumpet blast, and we will meet him in the clouds for sure. And then we will be with him forever as he comes to judge and bring heaven to earth like the subjects that rush out to the outer skirts of the city to welcome their coming monarch and escort him with fanfare to the city in which he is lord and sovereign. At the trumpet sound of his return, 
We will meet him in the clouds and escort him and his kingdom to finally and fully come to earth. We have been partnering with him all these years to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we who love the lordship of Christ over us will get to be fully part of that forever. This version of the rapture that I just taught you is offensive to many because it means that you will not get airlifted out before the great tribulation. Sorry, but I'm your friend. Do you understand current events? Do you understand church history? In our little North American cocoon, We've been able to enjoy persecution-free religious expression for a long time. But our brothers and sisters around the world, throughout history and even today, have no such luxury. And I would not be your friend to tell you today, don't worry about any suffering. Jesus is going to come and get you before things get worse. I have no grounds to give you that false hope. Will Christians be raptured before the great tribulation? Well, they never have before. They aren't right now, and I doubt they will be in the future. Worse yet, you may already have the mark of the beast on you, but that's for next week, so don't miss that. <laughs> Let me fill you in a bit more. You see, Revelation was written for a particular people at a particular time. First century Christians. But because it's apocalyptic, it also has futuristic implications. For first century Christians, their great tribulation, their antichrist, their beast, and Babylon was Nero and Rome. Tacitus, a young boy living in Rome during the time of the persecutions, became a Roman historian. And in his book, Annals, published just a few years afterwards, he wrote this. Let me read it for you. In the summer of 64, Rome suffered a terrible fire that burned for six days and seven nights, consuming almost three quarters of the city. The people accused Emperor Nero for the devastation, claiming that he set fire for his own amusement. In order to deflect these accusations and placate the people, Nero laid blame for the fire on Christians. The emperor ordered the arrest of a few members of the sect who, under torture, accused others until the entire Christian populace was implicated and became fair game for retribution. As many of the religious sect that could be found were rounded up and put to death in the most horrific manner for the amusement of the citizens of Rome. They were made subjects of sport. They were covered with hides of wild beasts and attacked to death by dogs, or nailed to the crosses, or set on fire for the ser to serve as the evening lights in Nero's garden. Most Romans felt their execution justified, but the ghastly way in which the victims were put to death aroused sympathy, because they seemed not to cut off, be cut off for the public good, but were victims of the veracity of one man. This weekend, Len Jansen's family had a funeral for his dear mom, Agatha Jansen, who is one of the thousands of German Mennonites fleeing the murderous, bloody persecution of Joseph Stalin. These were my ancestors as well. This was called the Great Purge. 9,000 German Mennonites were arrested in the Ukraine we were gathered up at night by the KGB and sent off to wherever, never to be seen, of, seen from again. Historians wrestle with the actual number of Stalin's murderous persecution, quoting the numbers between 10 million to 40 million. Families like the Jansons came to Canada. They came via China 
Man Manchuria, then to South America, and then to Canada. Christianity Today reports that annually there's at least 50 countries that are the most dangerous countries to live in as a Christian. They say that every day 13 Christians are killed worldwide because of their faith. Every day 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked. Every day 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or persecuted and five others are abducted. And that's to say nothing of those who are beat to within an inch of their lives or the millions who are displaced as refugees because of persecution. Since Jesus laid down his life, 43 million Christians have become martyrs. And just this last year, our partner in India, Joshua, his brother was beaten to an inch with, of his life. He's just now starting to walk again. This was the tamest picture I could find of his persecution. Joshua's eldest brother was killed in March 1997. He was brutally beaten and then later injected with poison. Joshua himself was attacked by extremists in 2003 and 2004 a number of times and fled to Canada to St. Catharines to Word of Life Bible School. That's how we met up with him. See, Revelation 6, 9 says, And when he broke open the fifth seal, I saw an altar and under it all the souls of those who'd been martyred for preaching the word of God and for being faithful witnesses. And they called out loudly to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge the people of the earth for what they have done to us? You see, Christians have always been martyred for their faithfulness to Jesus. Don't expect anything different for you. I've been asked, what if someone comes to our church and hears you preaching something that upsets them? My friends, the Bible, as Sarah said last week, will contradict you. And we invite people to come to Christ and be killed for following him. That might get a little upsetting. <laughs> you should prepare your faith fives when you invite them to church. That it's not all going to sound good or feel good. So what will your tribulation be? Your dad molests you? You watch your daughter get ravaged by cancer? Your grandkids get lost in a world of drugs? There are plenty of things that make us wish the rocks would fall on us. The final, last, great tribulation will be greater only in scope, not in intensity. It doesn't get any worse than Nero or Nazis or Stalin. Seeing your wife and daughter raped and brutally murdered before they slaughter you, it can't get worse than that. Only in how many people suffer that at the same time. So now, while you personally have such a peaceful, easy life, don't be a fool. Days of peace are days to put down deep, deep roots because days of suffering are coming. And you can be a Colossians 2, 6 kind of guy. You can continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. How will you survive whatever great tribulation awaits you. Let me give you five things, very practical, for this year and for the rest of your life. Join a life group. You got no friends? Simple. Join a life group and develop deep soul friendships now so you can be there for each other later. Secondly, stop being a church consumer. Be the church, every day, and together every Sunday. If you come for just what you can get out of it, what you will get will be anemic. It will not sustain you through the hard times. Come to give, and you will get everything you need 
to survive the hard times. Thirdly, feed on the word of God. Have it become your default to replace self-pity and selfishness and victimization. When hard times come, your default will either finish you off or it will sustain you. Is the word of God your default? If not, discipline yourself to know it and love it and feed off it. Jesus did. That's how he dealt with Satan's temptations. Fourthly, live in the Holy Spirit. Recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. Learn to live under his leading and guiding and learn to love his conviction and his counsel now. Because pain and suffering scream so loud, you must learn to tune in to the whisper of the Holy Spirit. And fifthly, obey everything Jesus has commanded you. Make obedience your default, even when you don't understand, because you will never understand suffering. It makes no sense. But your obedience will stop suffering from catapulting you into making matters much, much worse. Obedience will get you through. And even common men live uncommon lives in obedience to Christ. Even guys like me, common people, Amazing lives in obedience to Christ. My friends, if you haven't started here already, start today and surrender your life to Jesus. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for your promise that what in, in whatever tribulation that comes my way, you will deliver me. Deliver me today. As I read your word and worship you, Jesus, please make my roots go down deep. I want my name written in your book of life. I want to be with you for eternity. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom. I'm going to invite you to just stand with us and let's worship together in this last song. Trench my
Thank you so much, worship team, and thank you all for joining us. I really hope that you're able to sing that song with a genuine heart today. You know, the declaration, I surrender. The declaration, Lord, have your way in me. That declaration is at the same time the safest thing and the most dangerous thing that you could do. That's the most, it's the safest thing because it's a surrender into the loving arms of an all-powerful God who, in whom you have eternal security and hope. That's a safe place. And you know what? It's the most dangerous thing because when you surrender all to him, you become a threat. You become dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. You're a threat to the enemy because he knows that there's no such thing as a spectator Christian. To be Christian is to be on mission with this loving God, to be a force for his kingdom, whether that's through tribulation, as Pastor Tom just said, or whether that's in times of peace. But the reality is you can't do that alone. And you know what? You were never created to do that alone. Jesus came to create a people for his name. He came to create a community, not a bunch of individuals, a community to be faithful witness for him. And so if you're new here, maybe you've been joining us over the last few months. You've been just checking us out. That's awesome. We have a great opportunity for you this weekend and next weekend because we're relaunching our life group ministries for the rest of the year. And life groups, they're an amazing opportunity to intentionally journey your discipleship in community, to have people who are going to care for you and to, be, and to there's people for you to care for. And it's, it's just such an amazing place to be intentionally yourself for Christ. And we all need it. And so you're probably wondering, okay, that's interesting. How do I sign up? How, can I, how do I know more about that? Well, the easiest way is just to grab one of our Connect cards. If you're here in person, it's in the seat back in front of you. If you're joining us online, you can find that on our mobile app. You could also find on our mobile app a life group form that you could fill out. If you fill that out and put it in the, or you fill it out today and you put it in the boxes, I will personally contact you and let you know more about our life groups and see if we can get you into a life group most suited for you. We have all different kinds of life groups and all different shapes and sizes, all different types, and there's one for each and every one of you. And so please, if you're interested, uh, maybe that's your next step, fill out a Connect card and put it in, in the box. Um, or if you just want to know more about our church in general, fill out a Connect card and we'll get in touch with you, pray with you, uh, and let you know who we are. Well, if you did bring your offering today, you can uh, give that by putting it in the boxes here at the front. Or if you're online, you can continue to give digitally with our e-transfer or on our website. But before we go, let's pray together. Lord, thank you that you are a safe place. But this world isn't always a safe place. And we need you to journey with us. We need your power, we need your spirit, and we need one another to live fruitfully and faithfully in this world. And we will, at some point, face suffering, face trials, face opposition. And Lord, we don't want to shrink. We don't want to hide. We want to be faithful witnesses for you, to be a witness of your grace and your love and your mercy for this world, to be a sign today of what you're going to do Bring new heavens and new earth here. Restore this world. We want to be a representation of that today, not just in the end times. And so, Lord, come to us now and encourage us. For those of us who need to take a next step, just reveal that to us. What is that? And help draw us closer to you today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.